All right, turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 4, 1 Peter 4. The title of our message is Preparation for Suffering. Preparation for Suffering. This is the, one of the main themes of Peter's letter is suffering. And so follow along as I read verses 12 to 19 of chapter 4. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or a thief, or an evildoer, or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. If you were to take an orange and you were to squeeze it, all that citrus would would come out and you you would smell that orange. Like just do that in your mind's eye right now. Just squeeze the orange and do you smell that fragrance? It's so vivid that you can even bring to mind, even though you don't have an orange in front of you, maybe some of the kids do or something for a snack, but uh, you can bring to mind that, that smell. You squeeze that orange and that fragrance comes out. Well, if you squeeze a Christian through suffering and trial, there is going to be a fragrance that comes forth. There's going to be uh, a beautiful fragrance, fragrance that God brings forth even in crushing his saints at times through suffering. Christians have regularly suffered persecution throughout history and around the world. Fox's Book of Martyrs is a good example of that and it catalogs many of these stories. It's been uh, revised a number of times And there's just story after story of Christians who have many given their lives uh, for their faith. The West, however, has been somewhat of an anomaly when it comes to Christians suffering intense persecution. Though not completely an anomaly. See, I I think generally speaking, especially as Americans, we we kind of see suffering in our lives, and and I'm I'm generalizing, I know some have more acute suffering than others, but I think generally we we tend to view suffering as more of an anomaly to our lives, or or an interruption, maybe is a better word, to our lives, and we expect the norm to be uh, just comfort and ease, because we've had, we have so many things that help us with that. And yet, through, through most of history, it has been suffering and pain that has been the norm uh, f- for many, and when you when you take that just out of the general realm of of suffering in, the, in a fallen world, a world with a Genesis three hangover, as some have said, you you look specifically at suffering of Christians because they're Christians. That has been very normal for all of history, and yet here we we go well. Okay, maybe I've been made fun of because I was a Christian or I, I took a stand on, on some view, but. But to the degree that other cultures and countries have faced suffering, it it really pales. This has been the experience of all believers. Think of Abel and the persecution he experienced from his brother Cain and the first family. Moses, the persecution he experienced in Egypt. David from Saul. Elijah from the kings in Israel. Jeremiah. Daniel. In the New Testament, you have the apostles, the the great suffering that they underwent. Peter himself and and the suffering he underwent. In fact, at the end of John's gospel, he tells Peter uh, that he's going to have to suffer and die for him. Or or, sorry, that that John is going to uh, um, 
it, there's kind of this like interplay between like what John's future looks like and Peter's, and Peter's like, wait, what? <laughs> like, how, how, does this, how does this work out? And Jesus says, don't worry about him. Don't worry about it. Uh, G, uh, Paul it, it just stands out as, I mean, he, he has the, that passage in uh, 2 Corinthians tw- uh, 12 um, or 11 where he just highlights all the various ways he suffered because he was a Christian. It's it just, it's incredible. And then throughout church history, I mean, you could just pick out different people who, who've died, but even other Christians didn't think uh, not even that long ago, in the 1700s, George Whitfield preaching through uh, Europe and then, and then in, in America. And as he preaches in the open air, people are hurling rotten food, dead cats at him because of his preaching. And just uh, the ridicule and mocking it's from, from uh, something like that to all the way to being killed for one's faith. Yet, though we haven't experienced that level of intense persecution for most of us, I don't think, um, it is likely that that will change in, in our lifetime. It, it is likely that that will ramp up. I mean, it doesn't, you have to be pretty disconnected to, to miss the increasing marginalization uh, and maligning increasing of Christians who hold a very historic and conservative orthodox view of the world and very basic issues. Things that we believe that it's not a shock anymore for us to think that Things that we might say and articulate in public could be thought of as hate crimes and just different ways in which the church may be uh, increasingly persecuted. And so we need to prepare ourselves for suffering. And, and this is why Peter is so helpful for us. It's hard to know with certainty the time Peter wrote, but many think that he wrote just prior to the neuronic persecution when Nero, uh, the Caesar at that time, was persecuting the church at a, at a relentless level. And, and it, it kind of increased when um, many think Caesar, or, uh, that Nero uh, set the fires in Rome, but this, these fires in Rome that burned it, um, that, uh, you know, that, that statement that, uh, while, near, uh, while Rome burned, Nero fiddled, right? And, uh, and what did he, where did he find the scapegoat? It was in the Christians. And, and so he, he started to blame this fire upon the Christians. And then that led to increased persecution because Christians were strange anyway. They had all these weird beliefs, you know. They were atheists because they didn't believe in all the Roman gods. They were cannibals because they ate the body and blood of Christ. Uh, they were incestuous because they called each other brother and sister, uh, and uh, even though they were married, had, you know, they called their, their spouses brother or sister, and you're know, like, what's up with that? And so all these different mischaracterizations, and so they were hated greatly. And so this great persecution uh, would, would pick up. And many think that Peter writes just prior to that, just on the heels of that. So yes, there, there would be insulting and marginalization, but not maybe to the level that they were going to face. And so this is a great book of preparation for these early believers, and for us as well. We don't know what the future holds, and, and um, of course, we pray. We ought to pray for, like, a real revival, not like a false teacher Charles Finney revival, you know, that kind of thing, but uh, we should pray for genuine uh, revival of people coming to grips with their sin and the holiness of God and the sufficiency of the work of Jesus Christ as their only hope, their only Lord and Savior, that they would turn to him and and that God would regenerate hearts, change hearts, and there would be a change in, in our nation as well. We should be praying for that. But if, if the Lord does not see fit to do that on a massive scale, but, but simply in, in pockets, then we would likely see increasing marginalization, and I, dare I say persecution, uh, in, in our country in the years to come. And so our children need to be prepared for this. We need to be prepare, prepared for this beforehand. And that's exactly what he's doing in this letter. And it's just a, a reminder for us how relevant the scriptures are for us and, and how totally sufficient they are for any situation that we might find ourselves in. And so Peter here, he has already instructed us on suffering, and, and not only just general suffering, but specific suffering for a Christian. Yes, there's great principles to derive for general suffering in 1 Peter, but Peter's purpose is specifically to address suffering as a Christian. And so that's where this book really shines. And so in this passage, it's really one of his, his last main emphasis on this theme of suffering. He'll mention suffering more in chapter 5. But, but as far as instruction on how to face this suffering and how to prepare for it, this is probably the main text, and it's also the last main text that he addresses these issues. And so as we look at this, 
I want to break it down uh, into some different parts here, and, and I want us to observe five timely and timeless perspectives to prepare you for suffering as a Christian for the glory of God. It's kind of a mouthful. Don't try and jot it all down. Uh, five timely and timeless perspectives, so that's the issue, perspectives, five perspectives to prepare you for suffering as a Christian for the glory of God. Now, these are timely because Peter's readers needed to hear this just this time. And they're timely for us because we need to hear this at just this moment in, his, in our history. They're also timeless because they are just as true and relevant as uh, they were when Peter first wrote them. This is the, the timeless truths of God's word. This is how we must think about suffering as a Christian. Now, as I studied this, it was, it was interesting to look at different commentators and preachers and how they broke it down. And I was like really surprised. Sometimes this happens where like, like almost everyone has like the exact same outline and they all, you know, just because it fits and it works and it's like, okay, great. And so, you know, if my outline sounds like a lot of others you've heard, it, it's because it does, you know, and I try to tweak it somewhat, but it's really a, a lot of people uh, stick with this kind of outline. So that's actually really encouraging because you're like, yeah, we must be all getting it. And that's what expository preaching tries to do is it tries to match the, not only the point of the, of the text to the point of the sermon, but also even the structure of the text with the structure of the sermon. And so that's what we'll seek to do as well as we explain the text. So first, let's consider this first perspective, which is to expect suffering. To expect suffering. You need to expect suffering. Verse 12, he says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as if something strange were happening to you. And he begins with this word beloved. It means you're loved, you're a loved one. It's the term reserved for Christians. But here, let's just note that it's also a marker for a new section in the letter. If you go all the way back to chapter 2, verse 11, you'll see that he uses this marker as well. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles. And he began a new section there that carried on until where our section begins. And so now he's, he's beginning to wrap up his letter. This is a new section. And he, he, he tips us off to that by the doxology that just ended in the end of, uh, at 4 verse 10. And then now it's naturally a new section and he begins it with that new address, beloved. But it's not just a place marker. Uh, it's, it's also a very warm pastoral word to this suffering congregation. Because suffering can, for us as Christians, call into question God's love for us. Like, Lord, don't you love me? Why? Are you allowing this? Why are you permitting this? Why have you ordained this, Lord? Because it hurts. Don't you love me? I mean, have you ever asked that question when you've suffered? And so here's a very timely pastoral word to out of the gate encourage them and say, you're loved. You're loved by this God. Dear Christian, God loves you. He's not mad at you any longer because you're justified and therefore you're adopted and therefore you are loved. God didn't send the Lord, uh, the Father didn't send the Lord Jesus, the, 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 second, the Son, to die on the cross in order for him to love you. Christ died because God loves you and had set his love upon you. He foreknew you. And we've seen that already in 1 Peter. Later in verse 19, we'll learn again that we suffer, when we suffer, it is by God's will, by God's foreordination. And so when we can, or we can look at this and say, putting, putting these two together, that it's God's will when we suffer, and that we, that we suffer, and when we are experiencing suffering, we can know that God has, has planned this. And yet at the same time, we can know that we are beloved, that God loves us. So here we can rest in God's sovereign appointment of our suffering as well as God's sublime affection in our suffering, right? You can say God has sovereignly appointed this suffering. And you, you can also say in the same breath, God is going to demonstrate, and it doesn't call into question his supreme and sublime affection for me in this suffering. But after we struggle with the reality of, does God love me? And Peter addresses that. We can then start, be, you know, our next struggle is surprise. Like, well, why is this happening? <laughs> what is going on here? Why is this happening to me? 
But Peter is saying this ought not to be the case. You ought not to be surprised to suffer as a Christian. It's this word surprise that was used of unbelievers. Unbelievers are surprised at your godliness in chapter 4, verse 4. They're surprised that you don't go along with them in the same sins that you once ran after. So unbelievers are surprised at your godliness, but you should not be surprised at their ungodliness towards you. When unbelievers malign you and mistreat you and, and cause you to suffer for your faith, don't be surprised at that, even though they're surprised at your godliness. And so rather than being surprised at suffering, you should expect it. Expect to suffer. 2 Timothy 3 verse 12, Paul wrote, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. 1 John 3 13, Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. There it is. 1 John. 1 John. I plugged the First John study on Friday. I forgot to do that announcement. It's Friday morning, 6.30 a.m. So, study First John. Uh, do not be surprised, though, brothers, that the world hates you. John 15, 18. If the world hates you, Jesus said, know that it has hated me before it hated you. And so this is normal for Christians. This is par for the course, to be hated. Martin Lloyd-Jones writes, there is no end to the ways in which the persecuted may suffer. But that is not what matters. What really matters is the way in which the Christian faces these things. And so how do you face these, these fiery trials? Well, we should not view them only as obstacles in our lives, but we also view them as opportunities. As opportunities of our faith is what the text says. Do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you. Peter describes the suffering as a fiery trial and its purpose as testing. This is the same point he made. This is nothing new. Same point he made in chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. In this, you great, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith, the more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Did I go out there for a second? Uh, yeah. Did you hear that? <laughs> okay, good. Uh, so he's already said this. Now, what does this fiery trial do? Well, it, it, it reveals the quality of our faith. It reveals the genuineness of our faith. John Piper says it proves and strengthens real faith and it consumes performance faith. It proves and strengthens real faith and it consumes performance faith. When telling the parable of the soils, Jesus said in Matthew 13, 5 and 6, he said, Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil. And immediately they sprang up since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. And then he explains it to his disciples after they ask him, well, what does this mean? What do these different soils represent? And in verse 20 and 21, Jesus explains the meaning of the parable. And he says, as for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet, he has no root in himself but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. So, so it's the same thing. And Peter is, uh, is pulling much of his teaching from the Lord Jesus. And so that's the point. They, they may show a, there's this purifying effect that it has that, that those who don't really have a root in Christ, they're just like, oh, this is great, and they're all joyful. And yet... They hang on for a while, but then when this persecution comes, on account of the word, in other words, because they committed to this word, they, I'm out, I'm done, you know, and that's viewed in a lot of different ways. You see a lot of people deconstructing, you know, we call that apostatizing in Christianity, uh, and, and they desert Christ. It shows that they never really knew Christ. And, and so Jesus is saying, no, the, the, the mark of someone that God begins a work in is that he carries it on to completion, 
Yes, there may be great wrestlings. There may be great times. Christians may even sin in the midst of their suffering, but they don't let go of Christ because God doesn't let go of them. Tom Schreiner writes, sufferings are not a sign of God's absence, but his purifying presence. And so this is a sign that God is at work. And what a great gift of the Lord to demonstrate to us that our faith is the real thing. That's the real deal. I mean, if you could buy a gift and, 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 and have it, I mean, if this was a gift that you could buy, rather, uh, to know that you're his, I mean, you would, you would spend all your money to know this, for sure, to know for sure. And this is a way that God shows us to us, that when you experience suffering as a Christian, and, and you cling to Christ, your instinct is to cling to Christ, yes, you may sin in some way, but, but you, you hold fast to Christ, then it shows, whoa, I must be in solidarity with Christ. I must really be his. And what an encouragement that is, that you do, in fact, know him. Charles Spurgeon said, they who dive in the sea of affliction bring up rare pearls. Those who dive in the sea of affliction bring up rare pearls. What a rare pearl this is, the assurance that we are his. And so we expect to suffer as a Christian. And that in itself shows us, God tries us through it to reveal the tested genuineness of our faith. And what a gift that is. And so expect to suffer. Second perspective you need to have is that you need to exalt in suffering. Exalt in suffering. Verse 13. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. <laughs> what a strange command. I mean, uh, to rejoice when suffering. And yet Peter's not the only one to say such things. James 1, 2 to 4, count it all joy, my brothers, when you face trials of various kinds. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 10 and 11, 10 and 11 Blessed, or it's just like you have God's favor, but it's also this word for just happy. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So you're in a long line of Faithful Christians who have experienced the same kind of things. Why rejoice in suffering? Well, the first reason, he gives us really two here in this verse. First reason that you should rejoice is because you share in Christ's sufferings. You have a solidarity with Christ by virtue of the sharing of his sufferings. Now, this, this suffering with Christ or sharing in Christ's sufferings, it doesn't uh, mean that we somehow atone for our sins or someone else's. I think that's pretty obvious. But it means we, we, like Christ was maligned, so we are maligned. And why? Because our association with Christ, our solidarity with him. This is suffering that comes upon you because of your relationship to Christ. Because you have identified yourself with Christ, you then suffer like he did. And Jesus prepared his disciples for this, just like Peter's preparing us. John 15, 20. Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. So expect it, Jesus is saying. Philippians 1, 29. Paul says, for it has been granted to you, it's like a grace gift, that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. What a gift. And that's what he's saying. It's a grace gift to believe and also to suffer. And you experience in the fellowship of his sufferings, Paul will say. Oh, I want to know the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. And so instead of surprise at their sufferings, the early Christians, because they had been prepared by Jesus to suffer, instead of surprise, they sang when they suffered. They sang, Acts 5, 40 to 41. And when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. Oh, what a privilege 
to suffer for Christ and for it to be so evident and so clear that it was for Christ and not for our foolishness. That it was in fact that we have aligned ourselves with Christ and because of that, we are suffering. Praise God. You think of Paul and Silas, I think, in the Philippian jail and they're singing. They're singing out. And the jailer is, is so amazed by this. What in the world? I mean, this is like, who, who's, who rejoices in suffering? Who rejoices in imprisonment? And they're singing out hymns. You know, Jesus, I, my cross have taken. You know, <laughs> whatever. But they, they're singing. And it has such an effect upon this man. The Lord uses that to, to lead him to ask the question, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What do you have here? Is our Christ... Such a Christ that he would offend our world. Martin Lloyd-Jones writes, I was helped a lot by him this week and just his messages on the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 on this similar text. He says this, There are worldly people who tell you, or who tell us they admire Jesus Christ. But that is because they have never seen him. If they saw him, they would hate him as his contemporaries did. He does not change. Man does not change. So let us be careful that our ideas about Christ are such that the natural man cannot easily admire or applaud. I think it's possible that many so-called Christians never offend because they have made a Jesus in their own image who is not offensive. Now, we don't try to go out of our way to offend, right? We don't want, we're going to get into that. Don't be a meddler, right? Uh, but, but simply presenting the significant claims that Jesus made about the nature of man, the, the nature of salvation. It is very humbling, and it crushes the pride of man. And that's why they hated him, at least part of the reason. It attacked their self-righteousness. It attacked their sin. And so our suffering for Christ demonstrates our solidarity with Christ. But there's another reason in the text, verse 13, why we should rejoice. We should rejoice not only because of the solidarity that we have with Christ, but also because of the second coming of Christ. The second coming. You should rejoice now as you suffer because you will rejoice even more on that day when Christ returns. And it's, you're completely vindicated. And it's shown this was all worth it. Verse 13 again, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. The logic that Peter has here is that if you're suffering for Christ now and rejoicing in your solidarity with Christ, then you will be ecstatic when Christ returns for you. Like if right now you go, oh, I'm sharing in Christ's sufferings. I am one of his. I'm in Christ. I mean, your joy is going to go through the roof when he returns. And that's what he tries to express by these two different words for, for joy and rejoicing. It's like, the idea is that it's an intense joy. It, it's an inexpressible joy, like he spoke about in chapter 1, verse 8. It is like a leaping and shouting for joy. The second coming for the believer is the blessed hope, the joyful hope, the happy hope. Peter got a preview of it, of the second coming glory at the transfiguration. Jesus took these three disciples up on the mountain and he revealed some of his, his glory to them. And they were amazed. Peter said, Lord, it is good that we are here. Like, this must be the kingdom. This is the kingdom glory. So let's build booths because that's what you do and the kingdom comes. You build booths, Zechariah 14. And you celebrate the Feast of Booths. And, and he's like, well, it's not, yeah, this is a preview of coming attractions. All of Jesus' ministry in the first coming was previews of the coming attractions. The king is here. These are the kind of conditions you can expect when the king returns again, when his kingdom, kingdom conditions because the kingdom, the king is present. And, and so he got a preview. But then Peter writes about that experience years later in 2 Peter 1, verses 16 to 18. He, he says in verse 16 of he, 2 Peter 1, he says, For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when he talks about the power and coming, he's talking about the transfiguration. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty or of his glory. Like we saw that glory, that, that power and coming that preview of coming attractions. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was born uh, to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. 
we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven. For we were with him on the holy mountain. And then, of course, he goes on to say, you know, that experience was great. It was incredible. It was a once in a lifetime experience. But you know what we have more sure, more reliable? The written scriptures. So lest you think, I need an experience like that to really make it in suffering. Peter is saying, actually, you have the more sure word, the prophetic word written down. And that's what his point is going to be. But the point to draw out here is that that glory that he speaks about, that second coming glory, is the glory he witnessed in part. That day will show that it was worth it. It will prove that we are vindicated. And so our perspective of future coming glory of Jesus helps us in the present now to rejoice. It helps you to rejoice now if you have this perspective on the future. You truly believe the Lord Jesus is coming back. He will right all wrongs. One writer said, My whole outlook upon everything that happens to me should be governed by these three things. My realization of who I am, my consciousness of where I am going, and my knowledge of what awaits me when I get there. What a perspective to have that will fuel joy. And so we're to exalt in our suffering. Third, we are to evaluate the suffering that we are experiencing. Evaluate the suffering you're experiencing. Verses 14 to 16. Peter knows that not all suffering is the same. So he would have us to endure and exalt in suffering for Christ's name, but to evade suffering that is for our own sin. And he kind of brackets it. He talks about good suffering in verse 14 and verse 16 and bad suffering in verse 15. Now look at how he does it. Look at verse 14. If you were insulted for the name of Christ, you were blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. And so he speaks of insult for the name of Christ. This is maybe why some think that Peter writes just before the neuronic persecution uh, increases because here he's just speaking of insults, verbal abuse, which would increase to physical and um, even Christians being killed. Not that they weren't as well at this point. Stephen was an early martyr. But he speaks of this verbal abuse that they're experiencing. Christians are often teased, uh, joked about, made fun of in society. How do you respond? Well, when this happens, you must remember and evaluate the truth. The truth is you're blessed. You have God's favor. I mean, Jesus said that. He's just picking up on what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are you. And these things happen. He's saying, you're blessed. Remember that. You have God's favor. And what's the evidence of that blessing? Well, he says, the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. It's really uh, most likely uh, an expression that they refer to the same thing. The spirit of glory and the spirit of God is really saying the same thing in two different ways. So the, the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. It's come to abide upon you and remain with you. This is the indwelling work of the the Spirit of God. I mean, this is what it it shows. This is the evidence of God's blessing, this assurance. You, you, You realize, oh, the Spirit of God dwells in me. That's why I'm suffering. But also, that's why I'm blessed. Lloyd Jones says again, but if you look at it the right way, you will find a cause for rejoicing and will turn to Satan and say, thank you. You are giving me proof that I am a child of God. Otherwise, I should never be persecuted like this for Christ's sake. (laughs) Thank you, Satan. (laughs) So Peter says, hey, you're blessed if you're facing insults for Christ. But then verse 15, he, he talks about the suffering that Christians must evade. Verse 15, but let none of you suffer as a murderer or thief or an evildoer, or as a meddler. Now, Peter has made the same point again uh, in chapter 2, verses 19 to 20, and chapter 3, verses 13 to 17. So he's reiterating that same point. In chapter 2, verse uh, 19 and 20, he says, for this is a gracious thing, oh, that's, yeah, this is a gracious thing when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin, and are beaten for it, you endure. But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. So he has this category of, of suffering that is not your fault, right? It, you, you trust in Christ, you're walking with the Lord, and it leads to suffering for various reasons, versus a suffering that's like you're being a fool. This is your fault. 
You're acting sinfully. And he gives a, he, he wants us to evaluate this kind, of, this kind of suffering and see if there's reasons other than our allegiance to Christ that this is leading us to suffer. I mean, Jesus spoke about uh, suffering for righteousness sake. And Lloyd-Jones, again, he says, blessed are those, he, he says, he does not say, blessed are those who are persecuted because they are objectionable. It does not say, blessed are those who are having a hard time in their Christian life because they are being difficult. It does not say, blessed are those who are being persecuted as Christians because they are seriously lacking in wisdom and are really foolish and unwise in what they regard as being their testimony. It is not that. <laughs> so evaluate. Evaluate your suffering when you're suffering. Examine your heart. Is there sin that is the cause of people's mistreatment of you? It may not be, but Peter's saying, hey, that could be the case. Notice the sins he lists, though. I mean, I don't think Peter's implying that they're, I mean, what a church to be a part of. A bunch of murderers, thieves, right? It's like, uh, I don't think he's saying like that, that he knows of people who are, are murdering other people in the church, but he's just listing these, these categories of sins. And of course, there's a heart level to each of these as well. Don't suffer for being a murderer. Like, that's very obvious, right? I went to jail, but I'm suffering for Christ. No, you're not. You killed that person in cold blood. Yeah, but hate is included here as well and all the manifestations of that. Don't be, uh, suffer as a thief and greed is included there. You know, you steal something, you embezzle money for your company, whatever, you're going to have some kind of suffering, tangible suffering that, that might come. And that's not suffering for Christ. Don't suffer in that way. Or an evildoer. And this is a general term for wrongdoing. It's kind of, kind of a catch-all term. But then he throws in this one. It's like kind of sneaky of him. Uh, it, it's almost like you go like, murder, I'm not a murderer. Thief, I'm not a thief. Evildoer, uh, I mean, I'm bad, but I don't know if I'm an evildoer. And then he's like, meddler. And it's like he sneaks it in. You're like, no, no, no. Uh, what? And not only that, but this was a very foreign word. This is a strange word. It's the only time it occurs in the New Testament. It never occurs in the Septuagint, and it's not found in any literature, Greek literature, prior to the New Testament. So it's a little hard to, like, know what this word means. Uh, Peter may have coined it himself. We don't know that for sure. But the word has, if you, if you just broke the word apart, which is not the way to do word studies, but that's all we kind of go on in this case. Uh, it's not, you know, it's like butterfly. It's like, okay, it's butter that's flying. Uh, no, that's not what it is. You're thinking of like the stick of butter, margarine, you know, up in the air. And it's like, that's not how you do word studies, you know. It's like, oh, it means, you know, okay, whatever, you got it. Uh, so meddler, but here's, here's the, it has a, the words uh, belonging to another, and then a word that has the idea of an overseer. So it's like overseeing what belongs to another, if you put it together like that. And many think it, it really has this idea of being like a busybody, a meddler. That's why they translate it that way. Someone who's like meddling in other people's affairs. Like, this is their business, and you're just like, want your nose in it. We could say it's just being annoying. <laughs> being an annoying Christian, okay? Paul spoke about this in 1 Thessalonians 4.11. 2 Thessalonians 3, 11 and 12. He used a different term, but it's probably the same idea. Busy bodies going around, get snooping other people's business. And so here's an application. Don't be an annoying Christian, right? It's like, you might suffer for that. Don't suffer for things that are your own fault. That's what he's saying. Re replay the game film. Evaluate your suffering. Is there something that needs to be corrected? Or is there something to rejoice in because it's for the name of Christ? And then he ends with verse 16 by, by reminding us of, of good suffering again. Look there at verse 16. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. And so if it's not because of some foolishness on your part, but because of your faith in Christ, then don't be ashamed. Suffering as a Christian glorifies God. It, it, it honors him. Now, this term Christian was first used uh, not by the Christians, but for the Christians. It was a derogatory term. It was like a, 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 a dig against them. Often you'll hear people say that it means a little Christ. It's probably more likely to, it not, didn't mean that, but it meant a follower of Christ. We have actually in Marks 3, 6 and 12, 12 13, a similar term regarding Herod and his followers, followers uh, Herod's followers. Um, and, it's, and it's very similar to the construction of this word. And so that word meant followers of Herod. And so it's likely that this word means followers of Christ, Okay. Now, for as common of a, a term this is today, right? Like, that's the general consensus term that we use for, for followers of Christ, Christians, right? 
For as common as it is today, how many times do you think this word comes up in the New Testament? Like you kind of expect it to be like the word the. It's like all over the place. It's like every verse, right? It occurs three times in the New Testament. Here and twice in Acts. And in, in those times, it's referring kind of in a derogatory way. It's, it's like they were first called Christians in this place. And, and because their opponents were calling them that. Christians referred to themselves early on in, in, by a number of ways. They were, called themselves the way. They were followers of the way. Uh, they would call themselves saints. Uh, they called themselves brethren, you know, brothers and sisters. But not as Christians until later on, where they took it as a badge of honor. And so he's really saying, if you're suffering as this follower of Christ, though you're maligned, it's, it's something to glory in. Glory in that term. I mean, just take it and be like, yeah, I'll take that term, Christian. The term Puritan wasn't a term that they the Puritans, gave to themselves. Uh, it was another kind of dig, a derogatory term for them. Uh, and uh, yet they, uh, it's been taken up and it's uh, run rightly understood. It's, it's, we, we love these guys. We, we benefit greatly from the Puritans. Uh, <laughs> there's a funny definition of, a, of Puritanism by the unbeliever H.L. Men- Mencken. Uh, he says this, quote, Puritanism, the haunting fear that someone somewhere may be happy. <laughs> now that's funny, uh, even if it's not true, uh, and has a skewed view of Puritans. They actually did have a lot of fun, uh, but I love that, Puritanism, the haunting fear that someone somewhere may be happy. Uh, and so Christian, it was a term that was used against them, but became a term of endearment. And so if you're suffering in that way as a Christian, because you're a Christian, seek to glorify God in that name, in the name Christian. Glorify God in that. One writer said the most effective way to demonstrate that God is the preeminent treasure of one's heart is to relentlessly rejoice in him when all other sources of satisfaction are stripped away. In other words, when the unbeliever sees you suffering, persecution, things are being taken away, privileges, finance, you know, jail time, whatever. And when they see these things taken away from your freedoms and you still rejoice, and are overjoyed, they begin to realize they're not like me. The things that I cherish and value most have been taken from them. They still are joyful. What is going on? Why can I not take that from them? And so that's how you glorify God, and that makes God look great, makes God look like this great treasure that we have that is the greatest treasure. And they start to go, why do they think God is such a treasure? Why is he such a source of satisfaction for them? And that is the effect it is intended to have. And so examine yourself so you don't suffer for foolishness, but exalt God when you suffer for your faith in God, in faith in Christ. Fourthly, we see in verses 17 to 18 that we are to embrace suffering or endure suffering. Embrace it. Embrace what God is doing in this suffering. And these are some challenging verses, um, but I, I trust they'll become clearer as we look at them. Look at verse 17 and 18. He says, For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? This verse may strike us as strange for a number of reasons. The reference to judgment for believers, uh, righteous scarcely being saved. But here's the simple point, that God has a purifying judgment for believers right now in this life, and he has a punitive, a punishing judgment for unbelievers in the future. That's his main point. We know that the judgment for the household of God does not mean final condemnation because they're contrasted with those who do not obey the gospel, right? They don't obey the gospel, so they're not saved. That means that the others are saved. And so this judgment has to mean something other than final condemnation. And of course, Romans 8.1, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. A little cross-reference. And so the idea of this judgment, it can mean testing or deciding. Here, uh, we, we see, we get a lot of help actually from Paul. This will give you a lot of help in understanding what he's saying. 1 Corinthians 11.32, Paul writes, But when we are judged by the Lord, 
we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. You see that? So he's clearly not saying it's referring to actual, like, end-time condemnation. We are judged by the Lord. So there's that term of judgment, by the Lord, believers are. And then he connects it with discipline, the discipline of the Lord, so that, here's the purpose, we may not be condemned along with the world. So this is this purifying judgment, not a punitive judgment. Hebrews 12, you can look there, verses 4 to 11, speaks of God's discipline in our lives as well. But there's other texts that speak of this. In Malachi, Malachi speaks about a judgment that's coming upon the people of God, a purifying judgment that's then going to be followed by a a judgment upon unbelievers. There's Malachi 3, verse 1. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And notice the language of temple. Household of God, Peter uses. Malachi uses temple. Same thing. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says Yahweh of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire, like a fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver, and they will bring offerings in righteousness to Yahweh. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to Yahweh as in the days of old, as in the former years. So this is a purifying for the people of God. It's a judgment though. Then there's a judgment for unbelievers in verse five. Then I will draw near to you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the hired worker in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, against those who thrust aside the sojourner and do not fear me, says Yahweh of hosts. So, so they're back to back. It's the same order that Peter has. Peter says it's going to start with the household of God. And if it starts with us in a purifying kind of way in this life, what is going to be the outcome for those who don't obey the gospel of God? What is going to be the, so it's like a lesser to the greater. It's like if you're just, if you're experiencing God's kind of judgment now in a purifying way in this life, there is another judgment that is far worse I mean, this is the same structure of Revelation. Revelation 2 and 3, it's about seven churches that Jesus is addressing. Now, some of them, he doesn't have uh, anything to address in them, just commendation. Others, he's correcting them, and he's addressing these historical churches saying, you need to repent of these things. And then it transitions after the heavenly scene in 4 and 5 to chapter 6 to 19, which is judgment on on the whole world. And so you have this beginning with the people of God, the household of God, and then to the world, those who don't obey. And so these are days when we are going to see those who are true and those who are false through this purifying. Those who hang on, it's back to the parable of the uh, the seeds and the sower. This purifying judgment is going to reveal those who are genuine, those whom God has really done a work in. And so it's going to come upon us now. And how much worse will it be for those who do not have God as their father. How much worse for those who are enemies of God, whom God hates because of their sin? How terrible will it be for those who refuse to obey the gospel of God? Our judgment is temporal. Their judgment is eternal. They will face the fury of God's wrath in hell, in the lake of fire. It's been said, and you know, use this statement reverently, but that that Christians in this life... this is the closest they will ever experience the, the pains of hell. Whereas unbelievers in this life, this is the, the closest they will come to experiencing the comforts of heaven. Notice again, Peter likes to speak this way when he refers to unbelievers and the gospel as them not obeying the gospel. And what does he mean there? He doesn't mean a work salvation. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. But it, what he means is that there is a gospel command, a gospel imperative, that you learn the facts about Christ, that he's truly God, truly man. You're a sinner. He's the savior. He has righteousness. You don't. You need his righteousness. You need to trust in him. And you learn that, and the response is repent and believe. That's a command. It's a command to, to recognize your sin before a holy God, to be repulsed by that sin, and to resolve to turn away from that sin. Not to actually turn away from sin, but to have this, I'm done with this. And then to have faith is to go in the other direction, and it's to look in reliance and receive Christ for who he is and rest upon him. That is the command for 
what, how are we to respond? And, and that command is empowered by the regenerating power of the Spirit, but, but that's what we're commanded to do. And so he says, if you're unwilling to repent and believe, then there is a far worse judgment for you. That's what he's saying. And so have you obeyed the command, that basic command? Now, Christians continue to repent. We continue to believe. But have you initially repented unto life, unto eternal life? That's what he would be calling for here. May it be that you do. And look again at verse 18. He, he rounds this off and says, If the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? And this is likely a quote from Proverbs eleven thirty one, 31, or an allusion It says, if the righteous is repaid on earth, how much more the wicked and the sinner? Now, don't let this word scarcely throw you off. Um, Maybe better for us, just in the way we we use this word and other words, to to translate it as with difficulty. If it's with difficulty that the righteous are saved. And the idea there is that those who are righteous, those who are justified by God, they're declared righteous. If they have to endure all these trials— until they are fully and finally glorified, saved in that, in that final way, if, if that's how it is, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner is the contrast. Remember what Paul and Barnabas told the churches? Acts 14, 21 and 22. When they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. With many difficulties, we must enter the kingdom of God. That is the idea that he's saying here, that if the righteous is scarcely saved, if you have to go, if the righteous who are declared righteous have to endure so much before glorification, then how much worse will it be for the ungodly and the sinner? It's not, one study Bible said, it's not that final salvation is uncertain, but that the way to it is through hard discipline. Greg Forbes helpfully summarizes Peter's point here in these verses. He says, To suffer persecution in the present is far preferable to being on the negative side of God's eschatological judgment in the future, his end time judgment. And so this is a good time to stop and ask, what, what pl- place are you in the relation to this judgment? Are you enduring the, the purifying judgment of God right now in this life? Or will you experience the punitive, punishing judgment of God on that day? It is, a, it is a time to consider, to wrestle with the Lord and say, Lord, search me, know me. If you are concerned about this, then talk to someone. I mean, talk to one of us. We'd love to t- tell you about the gospel. But the basic truth you need to hear is, he would say, obey the gospel. How do you obey the gospel? Well, this next verse is so helpful because he says, believers are to entrust their souls to a faithful creator. That's what unbelievers should do. Entrust your soul to a faithful creator, to your creator who is your authority and one who is faithful because he's made promises and he'll keep them. And what is the promise that he will, that he has made and will keep? That if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So you can take him at your word. Your creator has said, though you have sinned against him time without number, that you will be forgiven and cleansed if you will take him at his word and trust him as Savior. This is what his last point is in suffering and how Christians should prepare. It's the same command that would be given to an unbeliever to turn to Christ. It's to entrust yourself finally to God in suffering. He says in verse 19, Therefore let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. This verse, I think, may be the greatest summary of 1 Peter. It's like 1 Peter in a nutshell. If you needed a verse, what is 1 Peter about? 1 Peter 4.19, the last verse of 1 Peter 4. This is it. He's talking about suffering. He's talking about God's will. He's talking about entrusting ourselves to God in that time and doing good. And so once again, he reminds us that the suffering is part of God's will for our lives. He said the same thing in chapter 3, verse 17. We know that God ordains all things that happen, including our suffering. Every ounce of suffering has been preordained by a loving Father, and yet there's no purposeless suffering. God has a purpose in all of it, and he is good. And so how do you respond when it comes? Well, he says you entrust your soul to him. This word entrust is a banking term. It can mean to commit something to another person. It's like deposit in the bank, keep it secure. 
Now the idea, and they didn't have like the modern banking system that we have today, so don't import that completely in, but the idea was maybe you went on a trip, right? And so you had all these valuables and you had to find someone to give it to, to watch over, right? Someone didn't dig into your house, uh, dig through the wall and take it. Um, and so you would find someone, but you're not just gonna give it to anyone, right? Uh, you're gonna give it to someone of good repute who has character. And so you find the person with character, the most character that you know, and you give it to them, you entrust it to them for that time. That's what he's saying. Who should you entrust it to? Faithful creator. He, he's telling you the character of the one you're to entrust your soul to. He's the one who's sovereign over this. He's also the one who made you and made the world. And he's also the one who's faithful. He's faithful to his promises. He will not allow you to be tried or tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. And so take your soul and place it in the safety deposit box of the sovereign creator when you suffer. As you trust him, and then you keep doing good. You keep doing good. Put your head down, keep serving, keep doing good, and you entrust your soul to him. This is so uh, wonderfully pictured in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, 1 Peter 2, 23, it says, when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. And then on the cross, in Luke 23, 46, he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. I entrust my spirit to you. And so we follow him in that way. Five timely and timeless perspectives to prepare you for suffering as a Christian for the glory of God. You're to expect suffering, exalt in suffering, evaluate our suffering, embrace our suffering, and then entrust yourself to God in suffering. Peter compromised his faith at one point when a little girl asked him if he was one of Jesus' disciples. Just a little girl, a little servant girl. I don't know him. And he denied the Lord three times. He didn't have much fortitude at that time. Peter also compromised in a way with the Galatians. Paul called him out for it. Peter had a, a struggle with this. It's a great hope to us that the man who writes this letter about suffering as a Christian and standing firm failed a couple times, yet he held on. He wasn't a Judas, though he looked like Judas for a moment. He held on. He continued to cling to Christ. God knows what he's doing in our suffering. He's working through this fiery trial to test you, to show you the genuineness. It was Samuel Rutherford who had many comforting and pastoral words for saints enduring suffering, who said this, the great king keeps his best wine in the cellar of affliction. The great king keeps his best wine in the cellar of affliction. What a good word for us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your wisdom and your care for us as your children, beloved by you. And Lord, though we may see increasing suffering. We don't know, Lord. We certainly would pray that we would see a turning of the tide, a repentance, a coming to you on a mass scale. And yet we also trust your ways. We know ultimately that before the world will get better, the world will get worse. That there will be a great apostasy in the end before the Lord Jesus returns. So we don't know where we are in that timetable, but we entrust ourselves to you, Lord, whatever you may bring. And may it be that in the times that you may bring of suffering for the name of Christ, you would just give us a great encouragement, that pearl, that great gift of solidarity with Christ that we may endure. And Lord, may we be a great blessing and encouragement to those who may suffer that we know and to encourage them in that as well. Thank you for your word. Thank you for being a, the creator who is faithful. Encourage us that week, this week with that word, faithful, that you are faithful to us in all your promises. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, please stand and let's end by...